I'm hoping that a lot of you guys were able to find the location that we were on, where we were last week. Um, but in case you cannot, I decided to basically throw, a, these are basically the maps from the Cornell Soil Survey. Did it, is everybody, hopefully everybody's taking a look at this. This is one of the maps. There's two of them that I'm going to show you. Um, and this is actually kind of an interesting juxtaposition for our lecture today because we're basically going to be talking about sort of soil spatial nature and basically soil mapping. But so this is the landforms geomorphology of the Cornell Soil Survey area. Okay, we were, I don't know if you see this, these deltaic sands, the codes for these like spots. This strip right in here is where we were. This is that arc port strip. Okay. To give you a sort of a little bit better, this is where the veg fields were in the gardens across from each other. This is where the cemetery was. Okay. So if you slip back, you can sort of see where that sand was, the delta, right here. Okay. We are here right now. We're on campus. Um, basically coming down Tower Road down to here and then to take this loop in here. So when you go to the map, you basically look for this section of the map. You're now in unit C1. You go and go to the C1 map, and then you can find the soils. Does that help everybody? Does that get us on the sort of the right path? OK. If you have questions about the location, just come talk to me, and we'll work you guys up ahead. OK? Good to go? All right. All right, so today we're going to talk about soil mapping. And we talk about soil mapping uh, earlier than later, which just, uh, per personally I think this would be better later in the semester. But we're going to talk about it now because in two weeks you guys are going to be going out to do some soil mapping. But this also serves as a nice sort of um, segue between soil factors and processes and this, this concept of weathering, where these soils are. And what we're looking on in the landscape. So you've heard my story about glaciation, okay? And you've gotten the weathering spiel, and you've heard me talk about, and you guys have read about soil forming factors, the five factors, those factors that are driving soil formation, and the processes that basically exchange between these drivers, right? Okay, well those characteristics basically distribute soils across the landscape. So if we start talking about distribution of soils across the landscape, maybe we should talk a little bit about mapping of the soils, how we, in fact, inventory those soils. And the tool that we as soil scientists use, and actually the entire United States and much of the world, is what we call soil taxonomy. But the tool that we actually use to map the things we call soil survey. Okay? And we have a number of different products. Here is a soil survey from the 60s and 70s. This is Tompkins County Soil Survey. You can see that it's really well worn. It's basically a paper copy. The new soil surveys and even the old soil surveys have all been updated and they're basically all online at this point. Okay, so everything that you have in here you can get online. Okay, but what is a soil survey? It's basically a systematic examination, description, classification, and mapping of soils in any given area. Okay, that's straight out of uh, not the book that you have right now, but it's the same authors. It's like three editions ago probably in your book this time as well. But basically, it's an inventory of soils. And in that inventory are basically four things. One is, is a map showing the geographic relationships of each soil, where they are and how they are positioned in space. Okay? The second thing is basically a text describing those soils. The third thing is basically a table of physical and chemical data for those soils, and then finally, an interpretation for the various uses. Okay, those are the four big things that we have in soil survey. Okay, and if you think about it, this is totally dependent upon the things that we've been talking about already. Soil forming factors, soil forming processes, geomorphology, weathering, and transportation. Okay, the text describing it, this is the stuff that you guys have already started doing in the field. You went out and you took a look at our port and you started describing it. Okay, that description, in your case, is mostly physical, but we can extend it to doing more as well as chemical analysis. And once we have that type of knowledge, we can start making interpretations. We have an understanding of how these soils are distributed, and we have an understanding of how these soils are made. Therefore, we have, a, in a sense, an understanding of how these soils function. 
Does that make sense? OK. Just as a segue here, who produces soil survey? Basically, it's a cooperative effort between the land grant universities, the federal government, and the county in the so where the soil is made. OK, so Tompkins County. OK, basically the state, New York City, or New York State. OK, a lot of different places to get the soil survey. I've already mentioned two of them. You can get them from the USDA or the NRCS. You can get them from the Cooperative Extension, as well as the experiment stations. And now you can also get them online. Uh, they're also off, often present in the county libraries. OK, so what are in these products? First, it's the map. Second is the characterization of the units. The, we call them mapping units. And I'll talk about what they are in a second. It's the classification of each one of these units. Okay? It's the correlation of this soil, so Tompkins County, this soil survey, to all the surrounding counties, and all of those surrounding counties to the rest of the state, and then from the state to the rest of the country, okay? to every other state. Okay? Because you don't want to have a map unit that's here, that's basically the same soil someplace else, yet we're calling it something different here. Okay? Um, and then the interpretations for suitability of a variety of different uses. OK, so what are the mapping units? We, colloquially, we just call these map units. Um, but mapping units are basically a, collect, a collection of areas which have similar defined soil properties. OK, that's the key thing here, because due to these similar soil properties, we can make interpretations similarly across these different soils within this map unit. OK, so I have a map unit. Similar soils are within this map unit. And we'll talk about what similar soil means in a moment. Okay. And if I have everything within this map unit basically being the same or similar, I can make interpretations that are similar for that map unit. Does, I know that's sort of circular, but does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Map units have a code. It's a two-letter code with a third letter that usually tells us a slope. But it's a two-letter code. It's capital and then a lowercase. And then it's followed by a third code, sometimes actually more. Basically a capital letter from A to F that basically describes the, the slope. Um, I've got two examples here, but you guys just experienced this last one, which is the Arcport Fine Sandy Loam. So the AR stands for the Arcport with a 2 to 6 percent slope, a B slope. Okay? And this is what these maps look like. Okay, this is a comic version of it. But the first two letters, CE in this case, that's the name of the soil, and B is the slope. So in this case, a 2 to 6% or 2 to 5, or depending upon what the code stands for. Does that make sense to everybody? OK, how, OK, go. There are exceptions to this rule, but we haven't gotten to them yet. But thanks, that's a good point. I will remember to talk about that. Uh, and, and it's not only just, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, OK? OK, so how are these units actually made? How do we actually come up with this map unit? Well, we basically take the pedon. OK, do you guys remember what the pedon is from reading? Basically, this is the soil that it is the identifiable soil of this unit. OK, so this is all of the characteristics for this type of soil, whatever it happens to be. So imagine this being an arc port. Okay, if this was an arc port, we have that AP with a BW and a series of EBTs, right, going all the way down to a C. Okay, well, you guys in that soil pit only looked at, a wo at one little section of a larger unit. Okay, you were basically looking at the profile of a pedon. Okay, so you were looking at this face. Can you imagine that? Okay, the reality is you know that there were a lot of these little units that were characteristically this soil scattered in that whole area. I mean, that's why I should just showed you that map, that sort of deltaic sand section. OK? Well, these guys can then be grouped, so you basically have a polypedon, or what we call a soil individual. All of these pedons within this soil individual are similarly characteristic. That does not make sense. They have similar characteristics. Does that make sense? OK? We call that our polypedon or a soil individual. This soil individual then becomes the map unit, which then fits into the landscape. Cool? And hence, we get back to the comic book. OK? Questions so far? Go. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. No, that's a good question. So, so if all of these polypedons are made up of this, why do we not just use this one unit? Is that basically? Well, the reality is that this is not exactly the same as every one of these other ones. Okay, this is a good um, technically. I don't want to do the technical term of this. Um, this is a representation of an arc port. It represents all the variation of not all the very. It doesn't represent all the variation, but it represents some of the variation of this arc port soil. This pedon that's right here could be right next to it, could be a slight variant. It's still an arc port. This soil right here could be a similar variant, but in fact, it might not be an arc port. Yet, it has similar properties that we can group them together as a map unit. So we call it a soil individual. Okay? This is the arc port. In all likelihood, everything else that's in here is an arc port as well. But there may be something that's not exactly an arc port. Yet it's still similar characteristics. We group it into the soil individual. Does that make sense? Okay. Go. Are all pedons the same diameter? No, no, no. Uh, this this pedon, uh, technically this can be basically a meter to basically 10 meters. Something, and basically that unit represents the variant of that individual. I, so if I looked at everybody in this room, I could say you're a, poly, you're a pedon and you're a pedon. You both could be the same in the same polypedon, but you are obviously different people. Does that make sense? No. Generally, all the arc ports are going to be the same size, but if I get this soil over here, it might have a 10 meter. So that's go. Unlike people, we are not discrete. So what we do is we make, our, and they're not necessarily arbitrary, but we create ranges of characteristics within which this soil fits. Okay? So whatever those boundary conditions are. And in some cases, some, for some soils, that range of characteristics can be rather broad. In some cases, it could be rather narrow. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, we haven't actually started talking about that, and we will later in the semester. But if you think about what a soil is, a soil represents a concept that we have created of how this soil is created and the characteristics within which this soil operates. Okay? That concept can range based upon our ideas. Okay? So if I have an arc port, it could be a very narrow range of characteristics. On the other hand, the Marden and you'll see this next week, can have a very wide range of characteristics. The range of soil textures can be wide. The so range of soil colors can be wide. The range of horizonation can be wide. Arc port, fairly narrow. But you guys have seen those EBTs, so there is actually a fairly large range of how those EBTs behave. Does that make sense? Kind of? Questions on that? Okay, cool. All right, so we've got these polypedons, soil individuals, the map units themselves. Okay, we have a whole set of map units, or the mapping units. Put them in context, okay? Now, what does the soil survey provide information-wise for these individual polypedons, or the soil individuals, the map units? Okay, well, all the things that you potentially can go do in the field, and some of these you have done already. You've already done color, you've done pH. But we talk about soil thickness, we talk about salinity, structure, water availability, engineering properties, textures. These are observable physical and chemical characteristics. These are not interpretations. These are measured characteristics. It is from these measured characteristics that we then basically start predicting capacities. Okay, so we've got these soil map, the properties of the soil map units. We have their position in the landscape. Okay, we also can tell you what percentage of the landscape that individual operate or op occupies. And then, because we have these measured characteristics, we can make interpretations. We can give you capacities: how much yield you're going to get, how much water infiltration you're going to get, how much uh, gravel you're going to get if you're going to build a gravel mine. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, infiltration for septic. All of these things that you might want to use 
on these soils. Okay? You know, now know where they are, and you know how much of the landscape you have of it. Which then gives us to how we can act to use this. Yes, we make lots of great interpretations. But it's dependent upon how refined the map actually is. Okay? And that brings us to scales. Okay? The scale of the map is basically the ratio of the length on the map to the length of distance on the ground. Okay? So if I have a scale that means it's 101 to 20,000, that means one centimeter on my map equals 20,000 centimeters in the real world. That's my scale, 1 to 20,000. Okay? Now, a small scale map is actually a really large number, 1 to 1 million. Which is the smaller fraction, this versus this? A small fraction is 1 to 1 million versus 1 to 10,000. This is a small scale map. This is a large scale map. The easy way to remember this is a small scale map, objects look smaller. A large scale map, objects look larger. This is always counterintuitive because people think, oh, a small scale map, that means I can see sort of like the entire United States. Okay. Small scale maps, you think, see things very small. Large scale means large. Okay. So in this case, I could see a map of the entire United States. Now, if I have a soil map of, the, map of the entire United States, and think about the scale of that, okay, it's right here. This is the map of the United States. What types of interpretations do you think I can make about my backyard? Nothing. On the other hand, this is my map, and it's an extremely large scale map. Okay, let's make it so 1 to 10. What kind of interpretations can I make about my backyard? A lot. But what kind of interpretations can I make about the United States? Okay? So the scale of the map determines what type of interpretations you can make. Okay. We call this actually soil order. Okay? Soil surveys can be conducted at a lot of different scales. We call this orders. Okay? And these range basically from first to fifth, fifth order, with fifth order being the smallest scaled, i.e. the least detailed. Okay. The order scale of the soil survey basically influences the map unit. Okay. If I was trying to map the entire United States, I would not be able to map that unit of Arcport, that deltaic sand, for example. Does that make sense? All right. So give you some idea about what these scales mean and the size of the map units and basically its use. Okay. Orders across the top, fifth through one, first, scale. We're looking at 100 to 250,000 or 1 to 1,000. Okay. Interpretation wise, if I'm looking at the entire country or count, a, count, a county or a state, I can use it as a resource inventory. At this end, I can basically use it for management of that site. Does that make sense? Pretty straightforward? Okay. All right. So let's get back to these map units. So here's that cartoon again. All map units are not necessarily the same. Okay? It has a lot to do with dependent it has a lot to do with the scale, but it also has to do with the nature of the material or the soils or the properties that you're looking at within the scale. Okay? A soil phase, these could in fact be soil phases. Okay? A soil phase is used to characterize some sort of special feature of that particular map unit. Okay? I could have four or five arc ports across the landscape, and they are all arc ports. But for one reason or another, one of those arc ports is different. Imagine the top of the soil got scalped. Somebody came in for whatever reason and mined all the silt off the top. Okay? That arc port is still an arc port, but there's something special about that arc port. We would call that a phase. You guys will be meeting a phase this ne next week, because you're going to meet one of the Martin phases, and then in two weeks or three weeks after that, you're going to meet a Hudson that's a special phase. Okay? The Martin version, Martin is typically an agricultural soil, but we have a Martin that's basically under forest. Okay? The timber was cut, but it was never plowed. It does not have an AP. But when you look at the description for Martin soils, it's always an AP. Well, I have a soil that doesn't have an AP. 
yet it is still a marden soil. That would be a phase of marden. Does that make sense? OK. We also have what we call consociations, where at least 50% of that map unit represents that soil series, with less than 15% representing a contrasting soil. You can certainly imagine scenarios where the soils are so, the scale that we're looking at is so fine, and the variation between soil types is so tight that we theoretically cannot, well, we could, but from a mapping sense, it's not logistically possible to map every individual contrasting soil within that area. Does that make sense? Okay. Yet, we still want to have some understanding of what's going on in that area. That's what we would call a consociation. Okay. I have 50% of, of this map unit is exactly what I say it is. But I know that there is something wrong. There's at least 15% or less than 15% of some sort of contrasting soil that is not going to interpret the same way. Does that make sense? OK. We also have complexes where we have contrasting soils that consistently occur in a very intricate pattern, a pattern so intricate that we can't map it. And then we also have associations where we have general groupings of soils that are typically occur together in that landscape. Okay. This is an association map for Tompkins County. Okay? All these different codes, these colors, are not an individual soil. They're a grouping of soils that typically are found together in this, type of, in this, in this area of the landscape. Okay? As you go farther north in Tompkins County, we find sweeter soils or soils that have a higher pH. As you go south in the county and into the higher elevations, we tend to find more acidic soils. Okay? Not all of these soils, not all these acid soils are the same soil, but they are all acid soils. Not all of these soils up here are alkaline soils, uh, are, are the same soil, but they all tend to be alkaline. Does that make sense? Okay. Another way of looking at this is this. This is a typical, this is a Chester Glenig Association. This is from Maryland. But basically, you're looking at a landscape concept. This is where these soils are found in this landscape. Higher elevations, Chester, going down into manors on the edges. Some Glenigs at, at shallower slopes, going all the way down into these bales and the Hatboroughs. And there's a couple more Glenigs up on the sides. So there's side slopes, Glenigs down steeper and down at the bottoms. We're looking at manors and the Hatboroughs and bales down at the very bottom. Okay. This is not a soil map. This is a concept of how these soils are arranged in space, though. This is the association. This is how they are associated. Does that make sense? Let's get another one. OK, this is, this is another Maryland one. This is Sassafras. This is the uh, 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 Sassafras Woodston uh, Association. Sassafras tends to be up in these upper elevations. Sassafras, uh, Woodston basically sits in the first terrace down into Fallingston, and then you basically get down into these tidal marshes. And some sometimes you're going to find a mat Mattapeak on the side slopes. These are all alluvial lands and tidal marshes, basically overlying sandy soils. Go. Do you get this in other landscapes? So can you make Sassafras Woodston Fallingston in like a montane landscape? No, you won't. This is just in this type of landscape. OK, okay so this is the coastal plain of uh, basically the East Coast. And it's only ever going to be that specific coastal plain? It's only going to, you're, there's, you're going to find other soils in here, but this, these soils are only going to be found in that kind of coastal plain. Okay. Basically from Maryland all the way down to, I guess, potentially Florida. So basically these three guys made their own series for the East Coast. These three guys? Uh, these three soils. soils okay. Yeah. These are individual soils, soil series. Okay. These are individual map units. These map units tend to be found together in this association. So this is the association of the Sassafras, Woodston, and Fallingston. How do you standardize all these differently named associations? Oh, the, uh, where the name comes from? Like, I mean, coupling this landscape with something on the West Coast. Well, the West Coast would have these types of associations as well, but they would be different soils. And you got to imagine, let's go back to those five soil forming factors and the processes, and then the parent materials and the weathering. 
the power materials that are here, these are sandy sediments, are going to be slightly different or dramatically different than what you see in the West Coast. Okay? And different parts of the West Coast, you start getting to the higher elevations versus the lower elevations, you get into the valley versus the, the mountain edges, you're going to have different types of combinations of the five, form, five soil forming factors and the four processes acting upon them. And you're going to produce, I mean, here, here, this is, I've showed you, these are both Maryland's. Okay? Well, this is to the north of us. Different parent material, shale sandstone with glacial limestone, shale tills, honey oil, our state soil. Lima on the edges, Candea, Palmyra and Eel, Palmyra and Phelps. This is that association. And you can see, if you look at the parent materials, here's a hollow with lions in it. Okay. Here's the eels. They're basically sitting on recent alluvium. Those Palmyras and Phelps on this side are basically sitting on gravel. Okay. The stuff that's up here, the Candea, Lima, Honey Oil, are basically looking at uh, limestone and shale tills. Does that make sense? Okay, here's another sequence, and this is, this is northern Tompkins County, basically, and here's southern Tompkins County. Okay, we're out of those limestone tills. Remember this map? Remember this map? Okay, that's the sediment. Those are the power materials that are forming that. This is the southern part of it. Okay, so northern part, limestone glacial tills. Southern part, sandstone glacial till, no limestone anymore. Okay, Martin sending up the ridges, moving down to Lordston, Erie, Langford, Bath, and Valoy, Phelps, and Howard down in the bottom with the gravels. Okay, <laughs> sometimes we'll get some freedoms down here, sometimes we'll actually get some eels as well. And then up in the hollows, up at the tops, so we get Volusias and Tullers. This is not a map, this is a concept of where these soils will be found on that landscape. Those are the associations. This is a map. But this, all right, so, uh, let's do this one. This, the blue, is, is that. Does that make sense to everybody? OK. This is where we're going to be going next week. See the ponds down here? High elevation right here. Ponds down here, high elevations up here. Martins, Volusia's up in here, Langford, Bath, Erie's down into the sediments down the bottom. Does that make sense? Now you can, so you can transfer this directly to that and make a map. Okay? This happens to be the Martin series. These are basically the slope aspects of this association. Does that make sense to everybody? Do we feel Fairly comfortable with this at this point? Go. Our association is generally controlled by its topography. Generally, it's topography. It's like a topo sequence. Um, off the top of my head, I can't really think of anything other than it. But it's not just the topography, it's how the drainage is working. Um, and also, a huge what these parent materials are. I mean, and this is a good example. You know, it's shallow here is these Lordson on the shoulders. But it starts getting deep at the top and the bottoms, and you start getting into these guys. But the minute you move that, that parent material, now this parent material is certainly being driven by the bedrock and the topography. I mean, it's not like water doesn't flow downhill. You know, that, and that's, you're going to get that type of material down there. And if you get that type of material down there, you tend to find these types of soils down there. Okay, other questions? I mean, this is, you know, th this is kind of cool if you think about it. Because in essence, we are mapping a concept. In fact, that's what soil survey is. Or that's what the technique is. We basically develop a concept of how these soils are arranged in space. Because the truth is, we cannot put a hole every place in, on the planet. We cannot physically map every spot. So what we do is we build up these concepts of how these soils are arranged, and then we test them. And we constantly test them. And then when we go out, is we look at a real landscape and say, is this association working? Is this concept working? Not the association. Is the concept working? And then we figure out where those break lines, those break points are, we draw the line. And then we test those lines, make sure the lines are, in fact, where we expect them to be, and the soils on each side of it are what we expect it to be, fit within those range of characteristics.
that is characteristic of that pedon and that soil individual. And then we call that a map unit. Does that make sense? OK. So this whole lecture, I mean, I've, I've lectured based on the premise of mapping. But this lecture has all been about how these soils are distributed across the landscape. Okay, and that distribution is controlled by these factors and these processes. Okay, well, let's take a look at some of those things in the landscape that control this distribution. And the classic one is slope. And we call this the generalized landscape position. But if you think about how water is going to move in this, or gravity is going to work in this, you can basically take a look at these different positions in the landscape, and you can predict different characteristics. Do you guys remember when I did that sort of slope? It looked something like this. It was about depth of soil, and it looked like this. And we had something that looked like this. And then I had actual rainfall versus effective rainfall. There it is. You can make predictions about what's going to happen just by looking at the landscape. OK, so let's take a look at the landscape. This is classic model. Basically, you're looking at the top. You're basically looking at the summit. You start moving into here, you're looking at the shoulder. Basically, we're basically using our body as the design. A shoulder, four, is the back slope. You get down into fives and sixes, you're starting to call, talk at the foot slope. And then you get down here, and you're in the toe slope. Basically, your body. Okay, So think about how your body sits, the head, the summit, the shoulder. And basically, the form of your body represents the form of the landscape. The head, the summit, the shoulder the back, the foot, the toe. Make sense? OK. Now, think about this model, and think about gravity, and think about that consociation that we just talked about, this one, or not consociation, the association we just talked about. Do you see the relationships? Kind of cool. So then I can go out to the real world. I know what this looks like. I can predict that. Pretty neat. Kind of ish. I'm only getting a few blank stares right now. So, okay. All right. So let's take a look at some of the other features that we look at. Slope is an obvious one. You go out there, you can you start climbing that hill, you know it's steep. Okay. So there are other features that we can look at that basically can help us predict characteristics along the landscape. Okay. Some of them are not so obvious. Drainage classes. Okay. Drainage classes. What is drainage classes? It's basically the measure of where the water is in the soil, but more importantly, how easily that position on the landscape is going to drain. Okay. If I have a rain event, how quickly is that water going to either move into the soil or move off the soil. Does that make sense? OK. So let's take a look. It doesn't rain all the time, and there's not water there all the time. So let's look at some features that predict, we can use to basically predict what's happening with the water. OK. We have a number of soils here. This is a well-drained soil all the way over to a poorly drained soil. OK. What are the features? We're basically looking at drainage features. We call them modeling or redox features. And we can predict how the water is behaving based on how iron is moving in the soil, or how it's reacting in the soil. You guys heard me talk about this in lecture before, as well as in lab. But what happens to iron when it is reduced? OK, we have iron. You guys know what it is, right? I put it under water, and I take the oxygen out of the system. OK, what's going to happen to that iron? It becomes mobile. It becomes reduced. Why? If I take oxygen out of the system, the microbial population that's in that system is still going to want to survive. And if it has the ability to use alternate electron acceptors other than oxygen, it's going to use those alternate electron, electron acceptors for respiration. Iron happens to be one of those elements that they can use. If they use it, they basically take the electron, from, or they transfer an electron to the iron and reduce it. Now, interestingly enough, when that iron gets reduced, it becomes mobile in water. And it changes color. It goes from the reds that we typically think of as iron to the bluish greens. Okay. Now, I can use those colors to like look at water movement. 
Okay, I'm really not that concerned about the iron, but I can use the iron to tell me what's happening with the water. In a well-drained system, the, the soil never gets saturated. If it never gets saturated, the iron is never going to get reduced because the microbes in that population, in that soil, don't need to use iron as an electron acceptor. Right? Does that make sense? And I can see that in my soil. I don't have movement of colors. I don't have greens. I don't have spots of red. Okay? As that water table starts moving up, the soil becomes more perched in that system. They've got more saturated system. That water starts moving up here. Down here, where the system is always wet, what kind of colors do I think I'm going to find? There's two distinct groups of colors. Let's talk about the irons first. Okay? If this system is always wet, what color is iron? Bluish green. Right? If I start seeing lots of bluish greens, I know I have long periods of time where this soil is saturated. Okay? Now, just above this, you see this zone that we call modeled? This is a flux zone. It gets wet and dry, wet and dry, wet and dry. So, some periods of the time, that iron is going to get reduced and it's going to move with the water. Remember, reduced iron is soluble. So, wherever the water moves, that iron is going to be moving with it. The interesting thing, though, is the minute that water gets into an aerobic area, without any microbes, simple chemical reaction, that iron's going to oxidize. It oxidizes, it's going to stop moving, and it's going to change color. And the color it's going to change to is red. So, if I have a system that's doing this a lot, I'm going to have iron moving up and down a lot. And the minute that iron gets touched by oxygen, touched, it's going to be, it's going to turn red. And so as a result, I have like leopard spotting in here. Above it looks just like over here. I don't have any saturated periods in here. So basically my groundwater is going from here to here. You keep this system up, ultimately the water table is going to get higher. Basically the same story here as here, except in this case the groundwater is fluctuating here versus here. Sooner or later, I'm going to get farther down in the lands landscape, down in those toe slopes, where the water is basically going all the way to the surface for long periods of time. Wetlands. Okay? In those types of situations, I basically have grays, in some cases, all the way to the surface. Okay? I'll have some potential modeling, but you'll notice in some cases I don't have any modeling. And then at the very top, I'm going to get very dark horizons. Nothing to do with iron. What? What's going on? Accumulation of organic matter. Okay? So here's my drainage classes. Now, depending upon where in the country you are, these drainage classes can move. But around here, if you have redox features, that's these features, redox features, this kind of stuff. If you have redox features and they are present between 0 and 6 inches of the surface, you have a very poorly drained soil. It's just the way it is around here. It's a wet environment. Okay? Start moving down, 6 to 12, 12 to 20, 20 to 32, 32 to 42, 42 to 52, 52 plus, you start getting into excessively well-drained soils. This is where you start finding those modeling features, those water features. We don't necessarily get out there when it's wet, but if it's been wet for some period of time, you're going to find these modeling features. And you can use the modeling features to tell you where the water's been or where it will be again. Question. Um, is that like a sand dune? It could be around here, it could be a sand dune. Now, it's important to note this is the drainage classes for around here. As you get out farther west, because these also have interpretation impacts, okay, if you get farther west out, out west, these poorly drained features are going to get deeper because of their interpretations. Okay, interpretations are not New York, are not New York, are not New York. I mean, if you go to Arizona, or the West Coast, or the Northeast, or the Southeast, interpretations are going to change because you're interested in different types of crops and diff different type of management issues. Does that make sense? Okay, good, go. About the inches, is that how far the spotting goes? Yeah, so if I find my spotting between 32 and 42, or my modeling, it's a well-drained soil. 
If it's between the surface and six inches, it's a very poorly drained soil. If I don't see it, it's excessively well drained. Okay. All right. Uh, we've sort of talked about these, and we'll come back on this. But I wanted to give you guys. Go. Go ahead. Could be groundwater coming up. It should be, it should be also noted that it, for these features, for these modeling features to be produced, this is not a day event. This is consistently been happening over seasons and years. Uh, yeah, a, a day event, you'll get some iron reduction. But if I just have a couple, you know, uh, s s you know, individual atom doing this, it's not going to be a big thing. I need to have lots of this. To be so that I can actually see it. They're like tide markers, right? They're like tide markers. You know, if if I have a flood, okay. Um, think of the bottomlands in the south. You know, right now with all the hurricanes, the water table comes up pretty high, and things float, right? Well, when you start seeing cars stuck in trees 20 feet up, this is not like Godzilla's walking around planting, tr you know, screwing with us. This is the water has basically floated something up and has left it in the trees. Okay, this is a significant event. Okay, if I see this over large expanse of my soil unit, I know that this is a moderately drilled strain soil because I'm finding it here consistently. Does that make sense? So let's take a look at some of these. I'm going to skip in ahead, but let's actually take a look at some of these features. And I think we're going to have to kill. Could we kill a couple more light spans up there, or turn them off? I should say. Can you guys start seeing that? How's that? OK, good. Cool. Al, can you still see us in the back? All right, cool. <laughs> All right, so these are organic accumulations. Now, this is a jello soil right here, so you can see the ice that's at, down here. But you can see these organic matter accumulations. Okay. But when we're talking about these sort of water accumulations, notice this one. You see the gray colors in here? These gray colors, that's the reduced iron. The iron has been reduced. But you'll notice at the top, Nice, dark, rich black almost. And that's the organic matter accumulation. Okay? So I have two sort of clues as to saying that this is wet, a, a hydric soil. This is a wet soil. First, I've got organic matter that's not decomposing. And second, I've got gray colors, gray colors, below, which totally tells me that iron has been reduced. And the only way that for, for that to happen is the oxygen to move out of the system. And in our planetary system, that means water's in there. Does that make sense? OK, so let's here's some of those gray features. You can see this gray feature right here, all, almost all the way to the surface. You can see these gray features. You know, they come in a variety of different colors. Blue greens basically indicate that the iron is still there. Stripped out grays, basically the iron's been lost totally. Even the, even the reduced iron has basically been moved to the system, moved out of the system. Then you get into sort of these. Here's that organic rich stuff up here. But you start seeing these reddish spots in here. This is a flux zone. Okay. Yes, the water is coming up up here. But for some period of time, this is a dry zone. Because for me to get that red, I need to have oxygen. Okay. Because I need to have that rust form. Okay. So you can, it gives you an idea about where these fluxes are, these table, water table fluxes are. Here, the water is pretty far up there. But you can see there's small patches of red. In this one, it's up here a lot, most of the time. Go. The other one that you showed the hydric soil, um, so that's just really, really undrained. Would that be like an area of standing water? It could be an area of standing water. I mean, it could be under the bottom of a pond, for that matter. Um, but all likely, because I'm looking at this stuff up here, and I'm looking at the vegetation that's around it, I'm guessing that this is at the edge of a pond, or it's in, been in drained land. You know, this is definitely. Ter a terrestrial system. This is not aquatic system, but it definitely has water pretty far in that system. There was an another question over there. No? Okay. Here's some redox concentrations. I sort of introduced that here with this one right in this picture right here. But let's start talking a little bit more about these. We're going to talk a lot about these in, in lab as well. But you start seeing these red masses in here. Okay, so we have the, the we have the the oxidation features. When, oh, 
I forgot to say this. Redox. Term, redox. Redox comes from reduction oxidation. Redox. Okay, sorry. That was a jargon thing. I apologize. Okay, so here are these redox features. Here's the oxidation features, these red redox concentrations. Here they become a little bit more apparent. In fact, I think the last slide was better. This side a little bit better. You can really see those reds popping out there. And to give you an idea of scale in some cases, some of these redox features can be within the same aggregate. Okay, so there's the penny to give you scale. We've broken this up. I pulled this from the web someplace and I have no idea where. But basically you're looking at the edges here. Okay, the interior is gray. The exterior edge, we're seeing red. So what does that give you an idea about what's happening here? Water's moving into the system. It's getting inside these PEDs. The water's staying there, but then when the system dries out, the edges dry out first. And then the water from the interior starts migrating out. Okay, if the water in the interior starts migrating out, it's going to be bringing the iron with it, right? And if it's bringing it out to the drying front, that drying front has oxygen, that drying front, that reduced iron is going to hit that oxygen and it's going to oxidize. And so as a result, we have these rhymes, these rims of red. Go. I don't know. I mean, there could be, but I, I don't think it, it, that does not necessarily have to be the case. I mean, if I have a clay ball and I soak it in water and I pull it out of water, the outside is going to dry first. And if it starts drying first, the water from the inside is going to start migrating out through capillary action. And, you know, the truth is it could, but it doesn't have to, to get this type of feature. Go. So how do we know when the gray is being that, um, like, there's no more iron there versus that the iron is reduced? Physically, I mean, visually, the best clue there is to have that bluish green versus just not you know, the color of the, of the matrix, whatever happens to be that material. The reality is you're basically going to have to send this to a lab. You, you can't really do it in the field. I mean, we do have some tests, uh, like drops and things like that. You can produce a color. But the reality is that most of this is going to go to a lab where you're going to do a test to find out that, in fact, in this zone, there isn't any iron anymore. Or in this zone, it's just reduced iron. We just can't see it. We have the iron uh, organic. Okay, in this scenario, I can see a few spots of red in here, um, and definitely that's more organic matter. You know, let's put it this way: if you see red in the system, modeling for whatever reason, there's still iron in the system. Okay, so even these spots that are not red, there's iron someplace in there. It may be reduced because the fact that I still have spots of iron says that there's iron in the system. On the other hand, if I get to a system like this one, where I'm not even seeing any red, the truth is there still might be iron in there, but we're starting to get more on the edge where there isn't any. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. The only way you're going to know for sure is to basically doing, doing lab tests on this, where you can force that iron out of the system. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. All right. So I want to take a couple steps back because I want to talk about these reduced conditions, these anaerobic conditions. Okay. What is the consequence of Oh, no, I can't. I am not. That clock is off again by two minutes. All right. We are going to stop here Friday, guys. Okay. Remember, next week we've got labs that are due. Okay. They need to be due before your lab. You're sending in the electronic version and any kind of and that needs to be sent straight to Jaipay. Any kind of pictures and things like that, graphs, stuff like that, that can be sent to Jaipay or myself, and that does not have to be electronic. Okay, we good to go? All right, my shirt is better than your shirt. Guys, be free. <laughs>